you, Dr. Panosan, for that in intro. Um, and thank you all so, so much for coming, for driving out to the valley in the middle of the week to, to see me speak about energy. Uh, my name is Mikhail. I graduated from UCLA last year. I studied environmental science and I'm planning on pursuing my master's degree at Carnegie Mellon University this fall. But before I get into this presentation and greening Armenia and get really into it, I really just want to give an intro or the background um, of it, why I was motivated to do this research and why I'm so interested in energy in Armenia. Because um, I think that is a big part of this story that I'm going to try to tell tonight. So I've been interested in the environment and specifically energy since high school. Um, I just think that how timely it is with climate change and everything affecting humanity right now um, and the science behind it and how humanity affects the environment and there's those interconnections between the world and humanity um, and how energy plays into that and how our fossil fuel based energy industry plays into that. I think that's fascinating and I never really, th I thought I would pursue that as a career but I didn't really think of involving it with Armenia until the end of high school when I was at Mari Manoyan Demirjan here in the valley and um, on our senior trip to Armenia after we as with all Armenian schools, we do a two, three week trip to Armenia and tour the entire country. But then after that, I had the opportunity to do an internship for two months living there in Yerevan. Um, it was at a research center called the Armenian Center for National and International Studies, or ACNIS. And on the first day, the, the research director asked me, Mikhail, what do you want to study or what do you want your project to be uh, for the summer? And I just thought I was only 14, and I thought, well, if I'm interested in energy and the environment, why don't I? apply that to Armenia or look at it through the lens of Armenia. So I was there for two months. It was a great experience living there for that time, first time away from home um, for, for that long. And then at the end of two months, I think I, as I was assessing my trip, I realized that I had three conclusions. The first one being after my, my research, my very amateur high school research. The first one being that Armenia is mostly based on non-renewable resources mostly natural gas and a nuclear power plant. Second, or to build on that, most of that energy, about 80% of it, is coming from currently Russia. Russian state-held corporations, private Russian uh, companies, it's mostly foreign, not owned by Armenia, the state of Armenia or Armenian companies. And then third, despite those two first two conclusions, there is a ton of potential for clean energy. Clean energy being two things, energy efficiency, as in using your energy efficiently and lose, not losing it while you're using it, using efficient light bulbs or appliances. And second, renewable energy, solar, wind, hydroelectric, things that we're familiar with, actual infrastructure that you put on buildings or structures. So I realized this and then as I was, I remember as I was flying back to, to Los Angeles, I, I, was, I was thinking about this and trying to assess what this meant to me and I, I was feeling a lot of different things. I felt, um, I felt really interested, I, I wanted to learn more. I just had done very basic research, but I wanted to put more into it. I, I felt a little angry or mad that Russia owned so much of Armenia, and I knew that that played into the geopolitics and the economics of Armenia being so dependent on Russia. And third, I, I at the same time, even though I was a little concerned, I, I was excited because I was so interested in the fact that there was potential for clean energy in Armenia, and I felt that I wanted to be a part of that. So hopefully, I'll go to grad school and I'm trying to continue this research that I'm about to present, but that's my goal. I'd like to contribute to this burgeoning, just starting out clean energy industry in Armenia, which I think could has a lot of potential. Um, but fast forward uh, five years to last year, after four years of undergrad at UCLA, and kind of out of nowhere, I found about this opportunity to even further my studies. So that came with uh, the Partnership Opportunity Delegation. So I heard that the US State Department organizes these pods, or PODs, to take intellectuals, investors, philanthropists in one industry from the United States, take them to a different developing country around the world for two, three weeks, meet with the intelligentsia, the industry leaders of that specific industry in that country, and figure out if where are the opportunities for partnership. They've done it, it's, it's been only happening for the past couple of years, maybe four or five years, They've gone to Colombia, different Asian countries, Latin America, um, for industries like water, agriculture, human rights, pairing together leaders in that field here with leaders there and seeing how the US can get involved and help out that country. 
And luckily for me, very randomly, uh, there was one plan for last October for clean energy in Armenia. Hmm. And the list, the, they put out a call uh, on, online that I saw that said, we want philanthropists, investors, scientists, diaspora leaders to go to Armenia and meet with the, the energy leadership there. And I thought that was so interesting. Um, but I was only a student back then, and I'm still a student. Uh, so I emailed them, someone at state.gov, a whole essay of why I'm interested in this, why I'm so passionate about energy, and why I want to get involved in this as a career, and they accepted me. So a group of eight or nine of us went there uh, in October for about two, three weeks um, with meetings based at the U.S. Embassy because it was run through the State Department. And we met pretty much everyone involved in energy there, or in clean energy specifically, people from the government, the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources, specifically the Deputy Minister, Hai Karutunyan, who you might have seen was kind of the government figurehead that was speaking during the electric Yerevan protests, uh, the Scientific Research Institute of Energy, which is a research arm of the, the ministry, and R2ET, R2E2, which is kind of this, the only um, non-profit in Armenia that's funded by the government. It's kind of, kind of like this quasi-governmental organization that does a lot of research in clean energy. We met people from all over the world, uh, representatives of the World Bank that are doing work in Armenia, USAID that has a lot of great projects, the EBRD, which is Europe-based, and the World Bank, and we met different researchers from the Alliance to Save Energy, AUA, of course, the Polytechnic University, where some really great work is being done on clean energy, and representatives of about 10 to 20 different private companies. So thankfully, the State Department and our advisor on the right, Patrick, the tall man with the blonde hair, uh, he led the trip for us. They really got us an audience with these great representatives to really get down and learn what was happening with energy in Armenia and where can we as the Asporns fit into that picture. So what I'm about to present is kind of like the summary of our results. Um, I've shared it with the rest of our delegation um, and they also more or less agree with what I'm presenting. Um, but granted, disclaimer, this is not complete. Um, this is the scientific potential for clean energy. There still is a lot of work to be done on uh, the financial and economic ways or means of getting to that of fulfilling that potential, but at least for now, this is where we're starting out with. And we're still having conversations with the State Department and with this group, um, figuring out where we can where we can move forward. Specifically, the State Department asked us um, basically to pinpoint areas in Armenia where, where we think you know the solar farm could be developed or where clean energy can be pursued. And that's what we're kind of working on. But that is kind of a hard task. So just to get down into it, I'll start off with just an intro to energy, which I think could be useful. Um, an overview of what energy looks like right now in Armenia, both non-renewable and clean, and clean again being energy efficiency and renewables. The potential for clean energy moving forward, what, where is there room to add on to clean energy in energy efficiency and renewables, and then our major conclusions. So this is, might be really basic, but I thought it might be useful, um, and I've done it in other presentations. So in energy, we have two kinds of resources, right? Non-renewable and renewable. Non-renewable, take a very, very long time to be replenished. So that's things like coal, oil, petroleum, natural gas, and nuclear fuel. They aren't very readily available or readily replenished. Um, not as fast as renewable anyway, which in can include biomass, which involves burning animal manure or green organic matter to produce heat or electricity. Geothermal, using the heat found deep within the Earth's core, or the Earth's uh, mantle. Hydroelectric, of course, using water to spin turbines, which produce electricity. Um, solar, solar photovoltaic solar panels which produce electricity, but also solar water heaters using the sun, sun's natural energy to heat up water, and wind, using turbines to spin, using wind to spin turbines to produce electricity. So those are the two columns, and what I'm really focused on is how we can move from non-renewable to renewable in Armenia. And what is energy? Well, it is the capacity to do work on something, right? Scientifically, we learn that in our physics classes, but for us, that means Basically, it how it applies to electricity, fuel, heating, and cooling. And for me, I, we focus on electricity during this trip. Um, so that's what this presentation will be about. Just in terms of units, how do we measure it? Well, first, you need to define power. Power is just the rate of using energy. Energy per unit of time. And it's measured in units of joules per second or watts. Those are equal. And then you can scale up watts, of course, to kilowatts, megawatts, gigawatts. But then energy is actual quantity used. So that's not the rate of using energy, but the actual tangible amount of electricity or heat that you have. So that's measured in watt times hours, the actual rate times the time. 
and it will give you kilowatt hours and scaled up to megawatt hours and gigawatt hours. Just to give, put this into context, how much is a kilowatt hour? Well, you can make 90 cups of coffee with it, you can iron 11 shirts, be on the internet for five hours, or use a blow dryer for three times. So that's what one kilowatt hour is, just to give you more perspective on it. Okay, so that's specifically, but in terms of nationally, which is what the State Department and what we on this trip wanted to look at, um, what, what, what's energy in the national scope? So an energy mix is just the range or percentage of energy sources that are available to a country, right? How much of it is coming from solar, how much from gas, how much from uh, coal. Energy security is the uninterrupted availability of those energy sources. So if a country doesn't have readily available access to energy sources within its borders, it'll naturally look outwards. And that affects that, that term, the term that encapsulates that is energy security. So obviously if a country is not, does not have a lot of access to energy within its borders, it will be energy insecure, um, which I think Armenia is. And because of that, because of that tie between energy security and national security, I think, and also the, the US Department of Homeland Security has defined energy systems to be critical infrastructure. I think it's right up there with telecommunications, finance, banking, public health. Energy literally gives us everything, our powers, everything, our cars, factories, electricity, lights, um, and without it, we can't move on as an economy. So it's pretty important. And therefore, since it's so important, it's very unfortunate or not great when, an, when a country is, does not have a great amount of energy security. Okay, so this is a map of the transmission lines currently um, in Armenia, but what, what does it use? Um, Armenia doesn't have a lot of proven resources in coal, petroleum, or a lot of other precious metals except copper. Um, if it, it, the, those, those, those resources like coal, uh, natural gas, petroleum are either there in very small amounts or not there. And if they are there, um, it's very, often very hard because it's very deep down at the ground and it's very hard to drill down deep and, and extract those uh, resources. <laughs> so therefore, uh, Armenia has looked outwards to replenish its energy or look, look for those energy resources. Mostly, that's natural gas and uranium coming from Russia and also natural gas coming from Iran. So right now, about 80% of Armenia's energy is fueled by outside countries, mostly Russia, and less so Iran. And that's because it naturally doesn't have a lot of coal, petroleum, and uh, uh, natural gas. So its consumption in 2013 for electricity was 5.3 gigawatt hours. So remember, that's a quantity of electricity. That's just some number, what might that mean? I've heard a lot that Armenia is compared to New Hampshire just because we're in a, we're a similar sized state. New Hampshire's electricity consumption in 2013 was 11 gigawatt hours. And New Hampshire isn't exactly the most industrially active state, so we're pretty small. What we're working with is not that much, but whatever it is, that energy is mostly coming outside of Armenia. Okay, so now let's look at what exactly is the breakdown. In 2013, there are three major sources of electricity for Armenia, or the big three. Number one was nuclear, coming from the Metzalmor nuclear power plant. Number two, natural gas, coming from natural gas firing plants that produce electricity. And three, large hydroelectric plants. And that's coming from two big hydroelectric plants. Um, the difference between large and small hydroelectric is just the size of that plant. If it's greater than 10 megawatts, it can, can be considered uh, large. If it's less than 10 megawatts, it's small. And the difference, one of the major differences is that small hydroelectric plants um, are often deemed by scientists to be less environmentally impactful because a large one might, for example, um, hurt a lot of fish, displace the ecosystem, really mess up the environment in that area. Small hydroelectric are more applicable to small rivers. It's less environmentally intensive. And other renewables are things like solar, wind, um, and biomass. It's pretty negligible. It's I, I was really generous with giving it 1%. It's somewhere between 0.5 and 1%. So basically, right now, what we're saying is, relative to these non-renewable resources, there isn't much action going on with renewable energy in Armenia. So let's go through each one. Metzalmar is the nuclear power plant that's supplying uh, electricity uh, by using uranium fuel. And that, even though the plant is managed by Armenians, the fuel is coming, 100% of the fuel is coming from Russia. Um, it's a Russian majority state health company that's, that's providing it. 
So the, the, the plant was create, was first opened in the 1970s, but of course you can see it's, it's on the lower left uh, corner of the map, about 40 kilometers away from Yerevan. It opened in the 1970s and it was supplying energy to Soviet Armenia, but with the 1988 speed up earthquake, um, like we've seen with other earthquakes most recently with the one in Japan, that earthquake caused tremors that went down to the rest of Armenia. And the government scared that it would cause catastrophic damage, shut the plant down, and essentially cut off all that electricity that was coming to it. And that really contributed to um, the, the economic and energy crisis that was going on in the 1980s and 90s in Armenia. So that plant was closed for a couple of years after 1988, and it's still considered to be dangerous. It was open in the 70s, but it, it being made in the Soviet model, it, at the time when it was first constructed, it didn't have a containment vessel, as in there was, if nuclear fumes or some kind of breakdown were to occur, it would be catastrophic. Um, it's located, as you can see in this lower left Aradak Valley, where at least 25% of the agriculture in Armenia takes place, agricultural activity, which would be horrible if any of that uranium fuel gets out and can contaminate that land in the Aradak Valley. That's horrible. That land can possibly not be used for millions of years if it, if it, if it is that bad. I'm actually, I've actually seen a lot of Turkish civil society groups and in Azerbaijan uh, citizen groups um, calling out on their governments <coughs> to pressure Armenia to close down the plant. There are scientists all over the world that say it's one of the most dangerous in the region. Um, Armenia has kept it open past, way past its expected lifetime. Um, and most recently I, I saw an article uh, yesterday uh, saying that a couple years ago uh, the Turkish energy minister joined a protest in Igdir, one of the eastern cities in Turkey, protesting Metamor. There's a lot of action and like people people want it to be closed. Um, but yet but Armenia has kept it open because of course it's supplying about 35% of electricity mix for Armenia. And it's involved with Russia. Russia is supplying the fuel, so naturally it wouldn't have a very easy time with closing it. Um, and this is just inside. Uh, as you can see it's very old um, Soviet looking, it looks like a spaceship, but it is providing around 35 to 40% electricity right now. So it has been working, but um, scientists still think that it should be closed. The Armenian government is in talks with uh, Russian companies to try to look at the feasibility of opening a new power plant, um, but the energy minister on our trip told us that that would cost around $6 billion, what they're looking at. But the GDP of Armenia last year was around $11 billion. $11 billion. That's half of the GDP. So they're trying to figure out how that would work. And if they move forward with that, I would imagine that they would, that would incur more and more debts on the Armenian government if they, want, if they go ahead and give a contract to, to a Russian company. That's nuclear. What about natural gas? So the natural gas uh, providing electricity to Armenia is coming from two major plants, the Hurastan Thermal Power Plant and the Yerevan Thermal Power Plant. Hurastan, um, they were both commissioned around the same time. Uh, the total capacity of Hurastan is 1.11 uh, gigawatts and it's Russian owned. So it, it was owned by a huge uh, Russian state-held company, R-A-O-U-E-S. It was recently transferred to the Tashid Group, which of course is a Russian-Armenian company based in Russia that purchased uh, the majority of Armenia's grid last year. So for us, we're calling this Russian owned and that gas is all coming from uh, Russia. The Yerevan thermal power plant is a little closer to Yerevan. Uh, its capacity is around 2.4 gigawatts, so it does produce a little bit more electricity because it was made to be more efficient. It's managed by Armenians, so it's owned by the Armenian government, but it uses Iranian-supplied gas. The Armenian government has struck a deal with Iran where um, some of that electricity goes to Iran. And in, in return for the gas that's coming to Armenia, Armenia will send some of that electricity to Iran because Iran often has electricity shortages. That's natural gas, what about large hydroelectric? So this is the third segment of those, those big three energy sources. That's the Hurastan Yerevan Cascade, or a cascade of multiple hydroelectric power plants on multiple rivers, including the Hurastan River in Armenia. It was commissioned in the 50s, so this is way back when, during the Soviet period. It's made up of seven HVPs, or hydroelectric power plants, and it generates around 10% of Armenia's electricity annually. It's owned by a Russian co company called the International Energy Corporation. The Vorodon Cascade, which is located in Sunik, the southernmost uh, province of Armenia, was commissioned a little bit later. It's made up of three hydroelectric power plants, supplies around 23%, a little bit more, um, and recently, actually, at the end of last year, it was sold to an American company. So a New York-based company called Contour Global actually bought that plant and now owns it. 
those are the non-renewable resources, but what's going on with renewables? Small hydroelectric, so again, that's less than 10 megawatts, ones that are less environmentally impactful. There's less than one gigawatt installed capacity. Uh, there are around 169 plants all over Armenia, and most are privately owned by either Armenian government, Armenian companies, or foreign entities, foreign companies. For solar, and this is two things, solar water heating and solar photovoltaic, producing electricity from solar panels, it's pretty, it's even smaller. It's less than 0 0.0005 gigawatts installed. And these are really sporadic um, solar panels. You might see them in Yerevan on one house here, one uh, on, the, on the roof of the American University of Armenia here. Um, it's not really like there's a huge solar panel array out in some valley outside of Yerevan. And there also are a lot of sporadically placed uh, solar water heaters here and there. For wind, there is only one wind farm in Armenia. It's the Lodi One wind farm. It was recently bought by the Dashev Group when they bought um, when when they bought the, the main energy network of Armenia. And by the way, the Dashev Group is the group, the holding group that owns Dashev Pizza. Um, for biomass, which is using animal manure and organic matter to produce heat electricity, even smaller. It's 0 0.0008 gigawatts, there's one biogas plant that takes manure and produces electricity from it, and that has, that has a capacity of 0 0.0058 gigawatts. And for geothermal, there essentially there are no geothermal plants right now in Armenia. You might think that it is a seismically active volcanic state, but there aren't any plants that have been installed to harness any of that energy for electricity. So just from the looks of this, so far we have non-renewable dominance in the market. Renewables are very small but there is some progress with them. So luckily with this, with this group, we got to tour some of it. Here we are uh, in Dilijan, um, checking out this small hydroelectric power plant. Uh, it's owned by Armenians, but all this equipment was donated by the Chinese government because they were interested in opening up a hydroelectric power plant in Dilijan. Here we are on the roof of AOA. So that's the American University of Armenia. As if you've been on Bagraman Avenue in Yerevan and you look up, you might have seen these coming over the edge, but these are on the roof. Um, and these are solar panels on the top, the dark blue, and solar water heaters on the bottom. And this is probably one of the biggest solar installations in Armenia. There really aren't that many huge installations. They're quite sporadic, mostly on a house here, a multifamily residential complex here, AOA here. Um, so it was interesting to see. Another great example of solar uh, in Armenia, a small installation, um, is at the YMCA in Spita. Spidag, of course, being in Shidag, but there actually is a YMCA in Spidag. Uh, so we got to visit it, um, and they had a project funded by a Swiss solar company that cooperated with the YMCA in Zurich. And they, through their friends, through their Swiss Armenian friends that they met in Armenia, they were very interested in connecting with the YMCA in Spidag. And from there, after a couple of visits to Armenia, they installed this um, array last year. So the, the, the YMCA uses it for all their activities, electricity, heating, all that. This is the Lori One wind farm. Um, it's located in Lori in the northern part of the country. It was established with the help of, Iran, of an Iranian company. It now supplies around 11% of electricity in Armenia, and it's part of that grid that's now owned by the Dashev Group. And again, the Dashev Group is a Russian-based company that was, owned, that, it, that was founded by an Armenian, but it is Russian-based. This is that one biogas <coughs> plant in Armenia, the Lusak Earth Biogas Plant in the Godaik province. It takes manure from nearby farms and produces electricity from it. So that's what's happening with uh, renewables. But for energy efficiency, which I found to be a really interesting topic um, and some very interesting results, also has a lot of action going on. There are a few key players looking in energy efficiency and researching it and actually developing it. One being the R2E2, Armenian Renewable Resource and Energy Efficiency Fund. This is a quasi-government funded slash World Bank funded slash private organization that does research and funds um, things like renewable energy roadmaps that looks at where in the country they can develop these resources um, and actually has money all allocated from the government to fund specific projects. Second is the UNDP, so that's the United Nations Development Program, which operates in almost all countries around the world and specifically funds small-scale projects here and there. Third is USAID, or the US Agency for International Development, where American tax dollars go around the world to fund specific projects, kind of like the UNDP. And there are also around 15 to 20 private companies engaged in energy efficiency that actually offer solar water heaters 
and thermal insulation in buildings or more efficient light bulbs to Armenian citizens. There aren't that many because, as you might imagine, not a lot of people are interested or can afford those kinds of improvements in their houses. So just in general, these, are, these kinds of projects that these key players are in, involved in are mostly concentrated in small-scale public and residential building projects. It's not very widespread. They don't have um, wide-scale energy efficiency, efficiency programs that are you know, across the entire country. It's just here and there where they've identified the potential and seen it to be actual or useful. If anyone's heard of LEED, um, LEED certification, those, those buildings, um, that you can find a lot of them here, that's often seen by the industry as being the highest standard of energy efficiency or renewable energy. So it might have everything, solar water heaters on its roof, um, padding in its walls for thermal insulation, rainwater collection on the roof, LED lighting, different things that give it this LEED certification or give it enough points to get that status. And there are a bunch in Los Angeles. I remember at UCLA there were at least between five and 10. In Armenia, there's only one in the entire country. And that was actually the first one that was found that was created in all of the Caucasus, in Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And that's the Khoren and Shushani Abedisyan school. So now I'll go into each, each one of these key players. So the R2E2 has this huge project called the Public Building Energy Efficiency Project. And its goal is to identify public buildings, things like schools, um, places where public officials or employees work, and make those buildings more efficient. So including things like window and door placements, insulation, and insulation is again, it's just padding, putting padding in the walls to retain heat and prevent heat loss uh, from the buildings, which would therefore reduce your energy bill. Um, it's reducing glazed surfaces, solar water heating, so putting those heaters on your roof, heat pumps, um, LED lighting. And this project so far has completed 79 projects. Um, the energy savings have been around 0.4 gigawatts, which is huge. Um, and it's reduced, it's saved um, about 100,000 tons of carbon dioxide from being emitted. So the Armenian government, as R2E2, has identified this as a sustainable model. They've, they've funded this project for years, um, and they're, they're moving forward with it. So even though it is small, this is one of the only few that is funding these kinds of projects, it is working. Um, and one of their main goals with it is to do it in public buildings so people like kids in schools or public employees in the government can see they're in that building while they're working, while they're studying, and can see, wow, look, this, this does feel better than being cold during the winters, or this, this is a cheaper uh, energy bill. So that's one of their goals. One, the second major or key player is USAID, of course. And similarly, they also identify, after doing research, places where they can implement these kinds of projects. Um, LED and compact fluorescent lighting, radiant heating, more efficient appliances and heat pumps, um, insulation, putting uh, padding in the walls, similar things as R2E2. And here there are two examples in Sunik, in one village called Darbas, they've actually retrofitted the entire village with LED lighting as their street lights, which you don't see here. Um, here, most of the, a lot of those street lights are still incandescent. But there, USAID allocated that money to there and it's, it's made it more efficient. Another example is in Godaik at a children's village orphanage. It's kind of small, but on the roof, they have installed solar water heaters. So in total, this project so far has completed 24 projects. It's benefited around 52,000 citizens, and it's saved about 0.0015 gigawatt hours, which might not seem a lot, but I know that for these, for, for a village in Sunik that otherwise might not ever get LED lighting, I think that's pretty incredible. Unfortunately, though, this program was had a contract for about four years, and it just ended at the end of last year. It was kind of just like a test run. Um, they wanted to see how it goes, but in their report, they were very excited and enthusiastic about it in their evaluation report. Um, one thing that the State Department did notify us about is that in general, around the world, US aid money has gone down considerably. There's less money to go around two countries like Armenia. They actually told us that at least a between a quarter and a third of the staff the, the Armenian employed staff at the U.S. Embassy of Armenia is going to be laid off next year just because they don't have they have less money um, than before. But one interesting thing is that um, on our first day at the embassy, when we met with uh, the, the embassy officials, the ambassador uh, John Mills Jr. wasn't there, or Robert Mills Jr. wasn't there, uh, but his uh, his deputy ambassador was there, and he told us, and I wrote this down because I thought it was so interesting. He said one of the points of this trip is to reduce energy dependency on Russia by whatever means. So I was thinking as I was on this trip, like why, why is the State Department so interested in energy efficiency or these kinds of projects? And after that, I realized, and after going through the entire trip, I realized that the US 
geopolitically is motivated to fund these kinds of projects, although small, this is how they're starting with this USAID Clean Energy and Water Program, they're interested in stopping Russian influence in the energy industry, be it energy efficiency or renewables, anywhere they can, just to stop that Russian influence in the Caucasus. They were very candid and apparent with that, uh, the, the embassy officials when they told us that, so I thought that was very interesting. And third, uh, the school that I brought up, the only LEED certified building and the first in the Caucasus, um, was funded by the AMA, Armenian Missionary Association of America. Um, it serves around almost 600 students from K through 12, and the place is great. It's only it's it's three stories. There's a huge solar panel array in the front yard. Um, they have a lot of environmental education classes for their kids. There's rainwater collection on the roof. Um, there are classes on agriculture. The kids grow their own plants. The kids lead recycling and composting programs. There are really water efficient toilets, succulent plant landscaping, a bunch of stuff. Um, and that's kind of just a very interesting landmark. Um, it's outside of Yerevan, but it's it's in the landscape of um, very inefficient uh, buildings. So it's it's just interesting to see. This is the most probably one of the most energy efficient buildings in all of Armenia. So that's the current state of energy efficiency. What's the potential? So after going through this entire trip and collecting all the the documents that we did, our group came up with these kinds of uh, results. If we look at the multifamily residential building age distribution, so the distribution of when apartment buildings in Armenia were built, around 44% are after 1990, 17% 1970-1990, and before 1970 around 40%. So it's mostly in the Soviet period, um, with a large plurality coming after 1990. But if you look at the building stock of multifamily residential, around 73% of those buildings, a lot of them being built during the 40s, 50s, maybe when energy efficiency uh, wasn't a huge top of mind issue. 73% were made of stone in the walls, 6% monolith, 20% concrete panel, and 1% being other materials. So what does this mean? Well, stone isn't exactly the best way to keep energy in walls. Um, just keeping stone and thinking that they'll, they'll have thick stones in the building and putting plaster on it isn't exactly how you're going to save energy for those families living in these tall buildings, that, which I'm sure you've seen dot the yeah, about landscape. And concrete panel is possibly even worse. Generally, it's thinner than those stones that they use in these buildings, and it has more heat loss, more heat flow going through it. So that, in turn, will, of course, cost the families more energy. If they are trying to keep warm in the winter, and more of that energy is flowing out, they'll try to they'll keep their appliances running for more. So we came up with these uh, results. The potential for um, energy efficiency measures in these residential buildings is particularly huge, just because so many of them were, were built during the Soviet period when energy efficiency wasn't a priority, and there are many improvements to be made. In 2013, there were around 430,000 apartments, 420,000 single-family households, but we found from multiple studies and confirmed by people on our trip that if that 73% stone that you see on the bottom right and that 20% concrete panel were addressed, and if they were to include more padding in their walls, more thermal insulation, there's a, a minimum 10% reduction in building energy consumption. So that's 10% that you could just take out that wouldn't you wouldn't need to account for with nuclear or some other non-renewable resource. There's a lot of potential in doing that. If that green portion, 70% and the 20% are fully uh, followed. There are some roadblocks to this, or, or, or some hindrances. There's lack of awareness. There's only one, only two um, non-profit organizations in Armenia that do research on energy efficiency. We met with one of them, the Alliance to Save Energy, that's involved with writing a lot of bills concerning energy efficiency in Armenia, but there isn't a lot of talk about it still because it's not top of mind for these citizens. They're thinking about other things, like their income, their their public, their health, uh, not necessarily their, their what their building looks like or how effective their building is in using energy. Um, there's a lack of domestic financing incentives. So naturally, the Armenian government has, it, and rightly so, it does have other priorities instead of you know funding energy efficiency projects and buildings. And so it hasn't really established a lot of incentives for people to pursue things like they would in the United States. There are tons of incentives that you might get from you know Southern California Edison or. SoCal Gas or DWP that can put in padding into your walls or give you more efficient appliances. There really isn't that yet in Armenia. And also, even though this does sound great, reducing 10% of your building stock uh, electricity consumption, it, there still is a high cost of putting in those padding or other materials in the building walls. 
But in general, from our trip and from talking to the, especially the, the Alliance to Save Energy, we found that energy efficiency should be more of the discussion. There's tons of potential for it. One example of something that's already happening is this building, the number six Daniel Vagojan building in the Avon district in Yerevan, which you can see, of course, is in the middle. And it looks a little bit different than the rest of the, the buildings. It might look like someone photoshopped it there, but it's not. It's because the UNDP, the UN uh, Development Program, funded a project to put in padding, increase the efficiency of appliances, uh, changing a lot of the appliances, the heating appliances that families had from gas to electric, and that caused a 60% reduction in the energy use in total for that building. And that's huge for the families because it, um, it reduced the, the total um, electric, electricity bill for the building by 6 million dirham. That's around $13,000, which in Armenia is huge for a total building that makes a huge difference for the families. So we're thinking from the strip, if energy efficiency is pursued like this, on, and on this scale of targeting one building at a time of these multifamily residential buildings, there's tons of potential in saving these families energy, um, getting away from Russian, uh, from dependence on the Russian fueled natural gas appliances in these apartments, and also reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the, in the process. So now let's go to renewables. So um, I, I broke down each, each uh, result based on each energy. So as you can see from the hydrology of Armenia, there are a lot of rivers, a lot of really small tributaries, particularly in the north, near Lodi, and also in the south, uh, in Sirik. In 2015, it was estimated that there were 102 megawatts installed of small hydroelectric, small being less than 10 megawatts, not huge, not really damaging the environment a lot. But theoretically, there is potential to increase that to around 250 to 300. Even though that might not be a lot, that's 0 0.25 to 0 0.3, it is something that um, the Armenian government and these other nonprofit uh, organizations and groups like the UNDP are looking at. Um, there are a lot of waterways, obviously, the key ones being the Debet, Ahurian, Parastan, Melri, and Borodan rivers. Most up to date right now, there are two projects that are happening uh, in hydroelectric power in Armenia the Melri and Akera hydropower projects. Melri is a co led project between Armenia and Iran, where there's a deal where half of the electricity, Ar Iran will fund the entire project, half of the electricity will go to Armenia, half of the electricity will go to Iran. So that's something, and it is in that southern part of Armenia that often does need a lot of electricity or might not be a grid connected often. Um, and the Akera hydropower project is interesting because it's not happening in Armenia proper, it's actually being funded by the Tufankian Funded Foundation, led by James Tufankian, and a German uh, organization in the Kashatov region in Artsakh. So that's outside of Armenia, but they've identified that as something to keep people there, supply electricity for the people there in that region where we desperately need to keep populated and make sure, make sure that people stay there. So that's happening and it is planned, both of them are planned to be uh, built and constructed by next year. But there are roadblocks to hydroelectric power. Um, there's a lack of reasonable proximity to adequate roadways and transmission lines. So a lot of times these hydroelectric power plants are in high up mountains or hills or in these forests that we have to go through, for example, for the one in Dilijan, and those aren't close to roads. So you can't necessarily connect all of them to the grid. So a lot of times these might be just connected to a village, a very small scale, and supply electricity for one village or one area. Another roadblock is the cost of installing these. Even though um, hydroelectric power is generally said to be cheaper to install and pursue if you have the capital than solar than large solar panel arrays, it still is pretty expensive, and especially for Armenia. And there are issues of impacts on wildlife. There are some environmental groups in Armenia that are concerned over um, large hydro hydroelectric power plants, and even some of the larger um, small HPPs. For solar, uh, this is a map of the solar energy flow of Armenia, so basically the more red it gets, the more sun that's hitting that surface area. So, so that's particularly in that eastern part of Armenia, where Lake Sevan, of course, is the most uh, highly elevated freshwater lake in the world. There's tons of potential for that, and scientists have mapped this out. Um, specifically, in 2015, there was only 0 0.3 megawatts installed. But theoretically, if this were to be aggressively pursued, there's actually more than 1,000 megawatts, or around one gigawatt out of that five gigawatts total 2013 electricity consumption for Armenia. So that's huge. Um, the, the, the literal fact that Armenia is so high up, um, it's mountainous, giving it that elevation, and it's lack of an extensive tree cover makes a difference. That's been identified as some of the key factors of why solar is so, has so much potential in Armenia. 
the average, I mean, if we want to look at it quantitatively, the average solar energy flow, or the average amount of sun that's hitting the surface area in Armenia is around 1.72 megawatt hours per meter squared. In Europe, where we just heard last week, Germany, for example, was, was running on renewable energy for, I believe, at least one straight day, the, that average solar energy flow is less. It's only around 1.0 megawatt hours per meter squared. And that 0.72 can make a huge difference if you're looking at large-scale projects. That's solar in general. What about solar water heating? Well, using this potential for how much sun is hitting Armenia, um, each the, the Armenian government, the Ministry of Energy has identified 2.75 meters squared as that surface area that can, they've, they've correlated that to heating up between 120 and 150 liters of water per day. The average residential water consumption of a single family in Armenia is around 250 liters. If only around three meters squared of having solar water heating material can warm up that much water, there's huge potential for that. Huge potential for installing those on roof, these rooftops of uh, the multifamily residential buildings, on farms, to supply energy to heat up water as opposed to using a natural gas appliance or a wood cook stove or something else that might heat up water. Um, the key players that I mentioned, R2E2, the UNDP and the USAID, are interested in developing solar PV and solar water heating. Um, the biggest project happening right now in Armenia is that the World Bank is working with R2E2 and a Spanish company, all three of them, to develop a very robust solar mapping project to look at where in Armenia does it make sense to put moderately to large solar panel installations to produce electricity. That process just started this year, so it still has a couple years to go. For solar, there are a lot of roadblocks. The most unique to it is that there are a shortage of trained energy engineers. For years, as you can imagine, Armenians in universities like AUA or the Polytechnic University have been trained by their professors who are trained by Soviet professors to think in that Soviet mentality of nuclear energy or natural gas used to the, the, the energy infrastructure that's in place. They're being trained to operate Metamor as opposed to how to build solar panels or how to operate a solar panel array. So there is that shortage of trained energy engineers. We asked the, the Ministry of Energy, are there plans to create a curriculum for solar energy? Um, they are interested in it, but they're, and they're just starting preliminary discussions with AUA to hopefully start a kind of solar center there. Solar curriculum in their environmental science classes, things like that to, to get the conversation going and actually have human capital to go with that infrastructure once they put it in. Um, also, compared, relatively, uh, solar PV is one of the, the highest, most expensive forms of renewable energy. Um, producing it or importing it, transporting it, it does cost a lot of money. And there are, again, there are a lack of financial incentives. Like with energy efficiency, the Armenian government recently just passed a bill that allowed uh, Armenian citizens to get credited or get money for the excess amount of energy that they might produce from solar panels. We call that net metering in the United States. That's very commonplace here, but in Armenia that just got passed in December. And there already there aren't a lot of families that have solar panels, but the, the ones that do now can get money if, for the excess energy that they're sending to the grid. For wind, this map shows the wind energy potential uh, in Armenia. The more purple, the more wind power density going through those areas. And these are more, more, uh, more often than not, these are high up elevated mountainous areas or ranges. Um, so they're circled, there's the Gelama range, um, there's Aragads in, in the center part of uh, Armenia, and also down in Sunik. In 2015, it was estimated that there were around 2.5 megawatts installed, and that's all coming from Lodi. Lodi one wind farm. The, the capacity changes, but it, in general it produces around 2.5 megawatts annually. Armenia is actually aiming for, in multiple reports, we saw that the government would like to aim for 500 megawatts by 2025, and theoretically there's tons of potential to use this wind power density, um, about one gigawatt. Um, there really is excellent power, wind power density, around one and eight meters per second of wind rushing through these mountain ranges, and the Armenian government is interested in explaining that. They just haven't yet. Um, because there are tons of roadblocks. Uh, there is a lack of reasonable proximity to adequate roadways and transmission lines, so often, like with hydroelectric plants, these are high up in mountains, very hard to reach, and not very close to major roadways. So you'd imagine it's hard to get a huge wind turbine or parts of a turbine up to that level, to that elevation. Um, lack of financial incentives. There's impacts on wildlife that a lot of environmental groups have brought up. Um, if, if you haven't heard, I mean, a, a major scare is of birds flying into them, 
Um, often cows are disrupted on, uh, uh, here in California, that's a major issue, cows being disrupted by the noise of the turbines. And fourth, high cost of, of importing and transporting wind turbines. But scientifically, there is tons of potential, and it's, uh, we, we identified those four ranges, Aragats, Gelama, Karachach, and Pushkin Pass as the, most, the highest potential. One really interesting kind of anecdote that I thought of uh, that, that was really interesting um, is that, that relates to wind turbines is how actual laws in other countries can limit how Armenia pursues wind energy. So this is kind of a dated map. Obviously, there aren't any railroads going from Azerbaijan to Armenia. Those have been cut off since then. But what you might think, how can Armenia get uh, wind turbines, right? If, it's not, if they're not being produced or manufactured in a factory in Armenia, naturally, you might want to get them from another country. So you can't get it from Azerbaijan, you can't get it from Turkey, you might want to import it from Iran or Georgia. So a lot of studies have pointed to Georgia as the way to get those turbines. They would be sailed across the sea on the left to either Poti or Batum on the west, those Georgian coasts, and then driven down either uh, by huge uh, railroad cars on, on railways to uh, possibly the northern part of Armenia. The only thing though is that, and this was in a USAID study that they noted as something that is barring wind energy development, is that on the railways in Georgia passing into Armenia, there is a rule, a law, that the width of the rail transport cannot exceed over the railway by 3.25 meters, or around 11 feet. Literally, the law that talks about how much rail, how much material can go over the railway because of safety issues is something that's stopping Armenia from getting wind turbines from Georgia. And if you look at it, there aren't any other, there aren't any other options because you can't really import anything from Azerbaijan or Turkey, and it's very probably not feasible to fly it over uh, with Russia or from Russia because those turbines are so huge. I just thought that was a really interesting point to, to bring up. Geothermally, um, again on the right is a major uh, geothermal area map of Armenia. You might think that there is a lot uh, because it's a seismically active volcanic country. Um, in 2015 there was no installed capacity, there are no plants uh, harnessing that geothermal energy. But um, the maximum capacity that they've, that they've deemed possible is around 75 megawatts. So there is some potential, even though you really need a high temperature, around 200 Fahrenheit at least, to spin turbines, to generate steam and spin turbines to produce electricity. Um, that's the temperature that you need, 200. Um, in general, Armenia doesn't have that many areas that get that optimum 200 Fahrenheit level. The two, one of the, two of the best cases are uh, Jermuk and Hankavan, which have around, which have reached uh, 145.4 degrees Fahrenheit and 107.6 respectively. So there are some areas where it can be pursued, but it's not really looked at as something that's the first thing we should be looking into because it's not very widespread. Um, the World Bank is currently financing a geothermal plant in Jermalpur, um, in Sunik, with a planned maximum capacity of around 150 megawatts. But there are roadblocks, as with other ones. Uh, there's low potential relative to other technologies because a lot of areas in Armenia don't reach that 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and especially with geothermal, there are high costs of site preparation, drilling, and plant development, which have stopped uh, Armenia from pursuing that. And last, for biomass, Again, biomass is using wood, organic matter, manure to produce heat or electricity. And there's that one biogas plant, Lusagert, in the Godaik province. That's, that's biomass. So if we look at a map of where, bi where biomass is concentrated in Armenia, it's mostly in the north, in Lori, where there are a lot of forest uh, organic mass, and also in the south, in Sunni. But it doesn't look like it's a lot. One of the reasons why solar is so prevalent or has so much potential in Armenia is because there isn't that much forest cover covering the land that could be touched by, uh, by the sun. So despite that, uh, there is some estimated maximum capacity of between 50 to 100 megawatts. Um, forest area, again, it's not that much. It makes up only around 10% of Armenia's total land area. And there was one step that we pulled from our research that said, if all of that 10%, uh, or excuse me, if, if all of the uh, agricultural output, if all of the manure from all the farms in Armenia were to be used to produce electricity, that would only still power one of the five Perastan thermal power plant generators. So it's not that much, but there is something. Um, the Armenian government is interested in that, in, in using that biomass uh, matter for energy, specifically for bioethanol. They're looking at, into that for fuels to power factories, uh, and also solid waste landfill gas capture. So basically that's when, when you have a landfill, um, if, you, 
if you rob that of oxygen, if you close off the landfill, it can produce methane, and in, in turn, that's been used in other cases to produce electricity from that methane. Um, some of the roadblocks are lack of biomass, uh, other than agricultural residue. There's not a lot of forest um, that you could use to burn to, to produce heat. Uh, there's lack of research and development. Out of all the energies that we were looking at, there were the least papers and studies on that. And there are also a lot of environmental and health concerns. A lot of environmental groups in Armenia aren't exactly for this because it would involve taking away um, the organic matter in forests, if, if they are inclined to use that to burn for uh, heating for stoves and things like that. So those are the five or four or five um, renewable energies, but in general, what are our conclusions? Hopefully that didn't seem too negative or anything, but that, that is what we saw. But at the same time, I think there still is a lot to look at for potential. The scientific potential is there. Number one, it's energy efficiency. We thought on our trip that the thermal insulation and more efficient lighting, those practices, putting those especially in multifamily residential buildings has huge potentials for saving those families and schools and other large buildings a lot of electricity. Um, there's huge amounts of potential in retrofitting that and we think that um, more projects like the UNDP or the R2E2 projects should be pursued. Before going straight 100% to those, to the shiny new objects of a solar panel array or a hydroelectric power plant where it might not make as much sense economically, energy efficiency we think has more potential for savings with less um, economic input. Second is hydroelectric energy. Um, in general, small hydroelectric, hydroelectric power plants are uh, considerably cheaper than large solar panel arrays, so we concluded that they should be pursued over solar PV, given their lower costs, uh, their progress already made, and their potential. Third is using solar energy. Um, because Armenia has so much potential for solar, probably one of the most out of all the energies, uh, potential in solar. Um, there is a lot of opportunities to develop and use solar water heaters. Again, with that, with that, using that uh, line of logic the, the Armenian government did with around 2.7 uh, meters squared supplying around 200 liters of water, we think that should be further pursued for uh, large-scale multifamily residential buildings. Solar panels still remain expensive and they also require a trained workforce, which we think, um, which we saw and talked with professors at the universities Armenia, unfortunately, doesn't have yet, but they are looking into educating uh, students. Fourth is wind. So wind energy, again, has huge potential for electricity generation, but there are huge issues due to the topography of Armenia to transport, and the laws, uh, to transport the turbines or the parts of turbines from other countries, get them up these huge hills or mountain passes to where they need to be and access that, that wind energy. For geothermal and biomass, although there are there is some potential for both, we concluded that energy efficiency and other these other technologies, the, the first four, should be pursued first. And in general, um, we saw and we very much believe that there are organizations or entities in the UN, the US, and Europe, being UNDP, USAID, and also EGRD, which is funding a lot of projects, are considerably more interested and willing to fund energy efficiency and renewable energy projects than Russian com companies. Naturally, Russian state-held companies or the Russian government might want to keep its hold on the Armenian energy sector. And here and there, it is lessening, for example, with that huge American purchase by Contour Global of the Borodon Cascade. That was huge, and not a lot of people expected it, but because of that, now Amer an American company owns a very large part of electricity production in Armenia. But we concluded that pursuing, some, pursuing projects with these other organizations, the UN, um, USAID, and the EBRD, would be a lot more fruitful and beneficial if Armenia wants to move forward with clean energy. So those are the conclusions, but um, I'd just like to end on kind of like a story. Um, this is back at the, the YMCA in Spitak. So my friend and I on the left, Narek, who was a law student at the University of Vermont, and I met him uh, in Armenia, but little did I know that he actually lives in Hollywood. He, he was also on the trip with us with the State Department. And we were at a conference that happened right before the State Department trip. Um, it was a UN uh, organized conference on sustainable energy. And there we met um, Andreas, who is a Swiss man who does not have a drop of Armenian blood in him, but because of Armenian friends that he has in Switzerland, and because of the fact that he's part of this solar, solar company in Switzerland, he's very interested in solar in Armenia. He also has friends in the YMCA in Zurich, one of the biggest cities in Switzerland, who have been to Armenia because they were establishing connections with the YMCA in Spidak. 
And because of that, he had visited and been to Armenia a couple of times. After that, after he, he saw the building that the, the Spithop YMCA has, which got remodeled after the earthquake, thankfully, and serves hundreds of kids, um, more elderly people, serves as a hotel also on the weekends for a lot of people, he saw that there was a lot of potential for solar water heaters and solar panels. So he put together a project um, with Nujda, who is in the gray sweater, who is the energy manager of the building, to develop a solar panel array and solar water heating project on the roof of the Sweet Dock building, uh, the YMCA building. And that took about a year, but they built it um, at the beginning of 2015. And they actually, that organization, that solar organization with the YMCA in Zurich, gave enough money to hire Nushda as the energy engineer in that building. And when, I, when so when we met, and not again, I met uh, Andreas at the, the conference, um, and he, he, offered to, he, he, he offered us a trip to Spitak. He said that I, he was going to do maintenance on it because he was in an Armenia and he wanted to check on how Nushda was handling everything. So he said, sure, we'll go up with him. Um, and we went, and obviously they were very hospitable, and Nujda was very excited to see us. But I just took a step back, and I, I took this picture because I thought it was just so interesting. Me, Nadeg, and I, two kids from Los Angeles, were here translating between Andreas, who doesn't know any Armenian, and Nujda, who just knows Armenian, trying to explain the energy units and how everything works and what the, what the YMCA needs to do here and there. Um, and how, what they should teach the, the kids in this one environmental class that they have, giving, giving the advice that Andreas is giving to Nizhna and translating that. And I just thought that that was amazing. This, this Swiss man who was just interested in solar in Armenia um, and got together with the, used that YMCA connection between Zurich and Spita randomly, put together this project and it's really benefiting the building there. It's probably the only solar panel array um, in in Lodi, or probably in all of the northern part of Armenia. And they made this work. So I was just thinking that if he were to do this, if a non-Armenian were to do this, he identified this very small scale project, got together investors from Switzerland who said, hey, there's tons of potential for this, we could help them out, we could eventually get energy savings off of it, and once they could possibly pay us back eventually. Um, if he could do that, we're thinking, or me specifically, how is that possible for us as diasporans. Maybe there is a potential for us to look at once more research is done and like a solar, that solar map that I mentioned is, is developed in Armenia, maybe we can put together resources or funds to fund these very small scale specific projects. Because to be honest, Armenia is not going to get rid of Mesamor tomorrow or the two power plant, the, the two gas fired thermal power plants you know, next year. It's going to be a very slow process, but at least the, and there, because there is so much potential for these resources, I think at least we can look into the scientific potential of where it makes sense economically to put on these projects and possibly do small scale solar, hydroelectric, biomass, these kinds of renewable energy projects like Andreas did. Um, and that's it. Thank you.